can we? Oh, yes. Good morning. And me too. There, there we go. Technology is wonderful. So uh, welcome to everyone who's just getting here and who haven't seen everything up to now. So my name's Don Clark. I just flew in from San Francisco where they think they're inventing the future. But now that I'm here, I'm kind of questioning that assumption. Uh, it's nice to have a real practitioner in the world of IoT as opposed to a technology vendor just selling futures that, that may or may not happen. Um, so Jonathan and McLaren, as you've seen, have been in this business a while and are one of the few p companies that have really got a track record, no pun intended, uh, about uh, using this technology. So uh, just before we get into that, I just wanted to say, um, give us just a, a, just a real thumbnail snapshot of McLaren Group. Uh, you know, we'll get into the racing, but talk a little bit about the whole panoply of things you do. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Jonathan Neal. Uh, I'm Group Chief Operating Officer for the McLaren Group of Companies, uh, and I've been there just a shade short of uh, 20 years. Um, many of you may know uh, McLaren products. Our history it comes from motorsport, um, 50 years uh, in Formula One, uh, in Le Mans, and uh, IndyCar, as well as other series. Um, today, though, the largest part of our business is uh, a sports car business. We make a range of um, products uh, in the sort of $200,000 to $2.5 million um, category. I'm not about to pretend that's a mobility uh, proposition, I assure you. Um, but there are some interesting things that underpin the technology in, in Formula One and uh, automotive that we may come to. And we have a third business, which is McLaren Applied, um, which started originally to be able to give us the technology that we couldn't buy in the marketplace for our cars, and then became a vehicle by which we would commercialize some of the capital and IP that we were generating. But is now probably our future as we look forwards 10 years when probably we're a technology um, business in a, in a series of verticals. We're based in the UK, we're about 4,000 uh, people, we're uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion uh, turnover business, something of that order. Fantastic. So give us a little sense of your IoT journey. Why did you ever start doing it and how did you start doing it? Um, IoT for us, it's, it's, it's not a phrase that uh, we would use inside the organization very much and it was very much an emergent um, uh, series of uh, properties. Formula One uh, racing has always been um, the pinnacle of motorsport and requires, teams are required to differentiate themselves technically. Um, lots of other cars race a stock car series, but Formula One you have to design, build, race and improve your, your product. And when I joined the organization um, back in 2001 at that time, um, we were still spending hundreds of millions of dollars on, uh, on developing the car and trying to improve it. Um, but the arbiter of whether that performance was working or not was the driver. And that meant that pretty much 80% of everything that we took to the car uh, would, would get either rejected or was, um, uh, the driver was ambivalent about whether it added performance or not. And that was incredibly wasteful. But you have to remember that Formula One is, is, even now, the best on the grid and the worst on the grid are separated only by 4% product performance difference top five cars are around 0.15% product performance difference, and that includes the driver. And if you've got somebody, as we've had until last year, like Fernando Alonso, um, that is a, he's a world-class driver, but it's still very, very narrow performance margins. And as sensors went to zero weight and zero dollars that became disposable, we were able to look in at that experiment much more uh, keenly and be able to determine exactly how was the driver using the car, where were the performance insights. And then we started to get more and more data uh, in the garage around the paddock. We then started to grow that out. We now take uh, four megabits a second of data off the car. We're streaming 17,000 parameters. Uh, some of those are math parameters, some are physical, and probably 10 gigabytes of data per car, per race weekend, all coming back into, uh, uh, into mission control in Woking from wh wherever we are around the globe. And if you imagine how that's developed over the last 10 or 15 years, what we've been through is sensors at the edge, high performance edge computing, secure data distribution, core simulation, including driver in the loop simulators, now cloud-based simulations as well, huge amounts of data. And now in the last three, four years, uh, the application of machine learning and AI to that, 
And when you look at that, what emerges is an IoT stack. So that belief fundamentally in, in simulation as being a means of being able to differentiate and accelerate performance at the product level from a fundamentally different uh, proposition. And that's what we do in our cars, our sports cars. And that's now what we've been doing in connected rail, uh, some connected health applications, elite sports, connected everything. Um, that opens up business opportunities for us. And of course, we sit poised, ready for connected cars as well um, for McLaren. So over that period of time is how our, our digital journey, uh, several waves of digital transformation ha have um, developed. So let's draw that one level down. So give, me, give us a sense of the, uh, the sensors that you had, say, 10 years ago versus what you have now. What are the examples of the kind of data you get that you, you didn't used to get? Yeah. So 10 years ago, um, the, well certainly we weren't getting the competitive, the competitive data that we now do. If you imagine that what the regulating body does is it provides for us all of the onboard footage um, for everybody else's car, a full, a full lap. And what the, uh, what the software tools and the AI is now doing is converting that into a time-based overlay of everybody else's car versus our own so that we can overlap exactly where uh, in a corner um, our car is either better or worse than anybody, anybody else's. Um, we've got pressure sensors all over the car for aerodynamic flows. We've got, um, even in the hub where the wheel is, you know, we've got uh, pressure sensors, temperature sensors. Brakes operate really well at 400 degrees centigrade and they melt your car to pieces at 600 degrees C and that can happen in half a second. So you have to be very alert. And in behind every Formula One team in behind the garage has got a range of technicians sitting on what we call battle stations. But it's not unlike having a patient in um, an accident, an emergency ward somewhere where you're looking at those vital signs and taking decisions in, in real time. Um, so it's, yes, hundreds and hundreds of sensors, everything. You name it, we can sense it. Even um, we were here in Barcelona testing uh, with Fernando three, four years ago. We had quite an unusual crash at turn three. And we were able to reverse engineer exactly what had happened because the sensors in the ear of the driver told us where the driver was looking when that crash took place. So it's, it's that, that level of abstraction um, that we're able to... Uh, so to he was on. distracted or looked the wrong way or something? No, what it said, it so he, he was looking down the racing line and the car steered itself off, off line. Um, but we wondered at the minute whether he was distracted down looking at something in the cockpit. The, the cockpit workload is very high for a driver because we're not allowed by directional telemetry, but uh, no, he was doing the right thing. Uh, the car failed him. So uh, since I cover the semiconductor industry, when people say the cost of sensors has gone to zero, I think, hmm, is that good for the semiconductor industry? I'm not sure. But uh, give it a, just a sense, uh, obviously zero is a bit of a metaphor here, but give it a sense of, a sense of the cost adder to, put, to instrument the cars this, this way. What percentage of the cost of the car is it? Well, if you look at um, just aerodynamic floor pressure sensors. Four years ago, they were 600 pounds a sensor. You know, so you, you dig them back out of a floor for that kind of uh, thing. Now, th now they're s less than $10. Um, so pretty much given everything else we're investing. Um, and top teams are spending three, $400 million a year putting two cars on a grid 20 times. So there's a, there's a value decision to be made about the recovery of that versus just the cost of time. So now we just, we just embed everything um, with sensors. So uh, Jonathan was giving me a treatise on a lot of this this morning at breakfast, which was very helpful because I hadn't thought about this industry. Just, just break apart a little bit how the each car gets to be made before the season. You were talking about the time lag and all that. So the, we have a new set of regulations um, published for each season, typically about this, this time of year. And then we've got a kind of three and a half month lead in to the start of the new season. Um, the carryover bill of materials from last year's car to next year's car on a typical season is less than 5%. So the moment that we start testing in February, which again will be here in Barcelona, um, that car will be 95% all new. And its useful life as, a, um, as an engineering solution or engineering uh, experiment against those regulations is about eight to ten weeks by which time it's obsolete because already the experiments in the wind tunnel, the simulation and the modeling has already moved forwards. And I find it amazing that given that humans have been racing cars since around 1910, 
It's still got four wheels. It's still got powertrain, uh, aerodynamics, madman in the cockpit. Um, the, the, all of those ingredients are still there, and yet we still haven't figured out how to optimize that. Um, any one of the cardinal performance parameters, whether it's power, weight, stiffness, um, just improves linearly over a 20-year period, punctuated only by uh, regulation change. I mean, we've seen engines go from V12s to V10s to V8s to now hybrid V6s. We're still lapping Monaco at exactly the same speed. Um, so the regulating body has to move to keep the sport safe. Uh, and it still has to be uh, a, a sport of human endeavor. But we're making, as a result of those insights from the sensor, the condition insight of the car, that enabled us to point the engineering resource at exactly where performance opportunities lay. And what that's resulted in now is that we're making an engineering change to the car based on a virtual experiment every 20 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in very small lot sizes. So the manufacturing organization is pushing 6,000 parts a week through the supply chain somewhere just to put two cars on a grid 20, 21 times a year. And it's, a relent it's, it's an arms race of uh, innovation. And the, it wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't got the problem into data and then built the simulations around it. And certainly wouldn't be possible if we didn't now have the ability to store and use that data and bring some of the, uh, the modern compute methods um, to, to bear on that. So you talk a lot about simulation <coughs> and including driver simulation and crash simulation and things like that. Talk a little bit about the, um, you know, what is being seen on the screen when these engineers are going through this, uh, uh, you know, re revisions and, and things like that. So what happens, a Grand Prix weekend is, uh, is three days. Um, Friday is about testing the product that you've just invented with all of the bill of materials changes. So, so the majority of our work on, um, uh, on Friday is about getting the two drivers to run different test programs. And we will test a blizzard of, uh, of small changes, making sure that the, that the guys and the, the men and women uh, engineers back in Woking in, in the UK are getting the data they need to validate did that experiment work. And then on Friday night, what we do is we run uh, all of the big simulations that say, what is the fastest car that we can put together for this circuit given the prevailing conditions? Um, and we give both drivers the same car customized to their setups on a Saturday morning. And then what you see in the garage it's on Friday the engineers are all sweating their heads about how can I use the available track time to get this army of change on, or this blizzard of change onto the car. On Saturday morning, when you look in a garage, there's a lot of stress about getting ready for qualifying. We've got one practice session at which to take that new bill of materials, which will be a, a, an all a quite a heavily changed car compared to the car the guys had the day before, and then they'll compete with each other and everybody else on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday evening, we then know where the fast cars, the slow cars, and where the drivers are to each other. And mission control in Woking switches slightly and goes into um, full warfare mode, where we're then running all of the gaming theory, the Bayesian maths, and the inference calculations that are looking at how do we optimize uh, our, our race event. And we're running uh, huge amounts of supercomputing during the one and a half hour race, which gives the race engineers a view on not only what has happened and what's happening to everybody else, but also what is the range of possible? How, you know, what are the choices that, that we can make to be able to optimize our position on any given day? So on Friday night, the, the driver, uh, they sit at a simulator and they go through the, so the car as, as designed? So we have uh, the, the race drivers themselves will be sitting at the circuit, probably talking to sponsors. But that's when the unsung heroes of Formula One, the development drivers, do their work. So somebody who we and the race drivers trust will climb into a driver-in-the-loop simulator running the actual wind tunnel model, um, the, the engine uh, model from Renault's dyno, our vehicle model, our own custom-built tire models, and putting all of that together to say, okay, given that, that the engineers say this is the fastest menu of parts that we'll make, how do we give the driver a setup that will actually exploit the car on that circuit, and that's running the simulator overnight. So there's a series of uh, the setup sheet for Saturday morning, and both drivers start from there and then chase the developing grip. So they have a, a sort of a set of a advisories, you know, take this turn at this speed or something li like that? Yeah. yeah, certainly in terms of, um, it's, it's normally about protecting tires. So to the maximum uh, 
So we're doing a number of things. We're scheduling energy. Uh, Formula One, you'd be forgiven for uh, not knowing this because we haven't done a great job in the media with it. But it's an energy constrained series. Um, the, the it's a petrol hybrid uh, engine. It has electric motors, a battery, an internal combustion engine that's running incredibly efficiency, 49% 40, thermal efficiency. And we're doing round trip efficiency um, with a car that's designed to fail. Uh, the tires are designed to fail. Um, contact with the competition causes the car to fail. Uh, the car is designed to expire because uh, we're not carrying any more weight than we possibly need to. And it's about managing that complex set of variables um, at, at over an hour and a half uh, period. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work uh, there. So uh, you talk about this concept of the digital twin. So um, this really comes, in, if I understand it completely from what you're saying, <coughs> you basically have a, a model of the car that's, that's uh, and you put it through all kinds of tests and, and scenarios. Yeah, that's right. The, um, I think digital twin may mean uh, slightly different things to different people, so I'm going to talk about what it means to us as McLaren. All of the Formula One development is done in a virtual environment. We get the opportunity to validate it every two weeks at a Grand Prix weekend, and the first thing that a driver does on Monday morning when they come back into the factory is to climb back into the simulator and validate the model so that we've always got a simulation that is, that is relevant and close. And we've now got to the stage of maturity where when we see a, a, some fundamental lack of correlation on the model, we know that's us pushing the physics too hard, not a problem with our compute or modeling assumptions. So the digital twin is now really the digital master in, in Formula One. We do everything in a virtual environment. We just validate on the track. And we've ported that across to our sports car business so that in sports cars, when it comes, the, f the first car that we made, the McLaren 12C in the, in the current generation, we'd done a, a McLaren um, uh, F1 uh, uh, car some time ago. But in the modern generation, the 12C car was a phenomenal sports car. And we built it through the, through the simulation. And um, by using the, the our belief that fundamentally there's a better way to do materials, vehicle dynamics, engine integration, etc. We built the car and we gave it to the journalists, and they all said, "This is a fantastic car. We love this car." And then over about a month, we said, "But it just lacks a little bit of something. We don't know what that something is." So we had to get a whole load of drivers and people in the car. We had to actually make the car worse to make it more engaging. Um, we built a car that was so optimal in, in terms of its performance that it was almost too easy to drive. It lacked a little bit of engagement, so we had to change the noise. We had to change the feel of the door handles. We had to, we had to make the gear shifts worse. So there was a little torque blip. There's no need to have a torque brake in the middle of a gear shift. You just keep driving and accelerating. I thought you were going to say you added a hood ornament. Well, we, just <laughs> we, had to, we had to just change it because the goal here is not technical excellence. It is in Formula One, but the goal here in a sports car is giving a driver something that they passionately want to engage with. But that can be codified. So we've got 360 parameters that codify whatever v -v vum is. You know, in, in That's <laughs> right. And, and it seems like you know, for the uh, racing, you're, you're quantifying or optimizing performance techniques where with a, a, a design you sell to consumers, uh, aesthetics play into it. Uh, very much so. But there's also a hard business sense to this. So we don't do this for technology's sake. The reality of having that, that fundamental toolkit of simulation and modeling is that the amount of working capital that you require in the business and the time to market for your products is shorter. We don't go through the normal number of uh, vehicle prototypes or prove outs or empirical testing that a conventional process would deliver. If you're confident enough and you've worked hard and validated your, uh, uh, your digital twin or your, or your belief in the simulations and federated that from, from the edge or on board, in this case for a sports car, to your core compute, to your cloud and, um, and, and uh, AI services that are sitting in the back. Once you've got that, then time to market is short, working capital is short, and your model life cycles become more predictable. So there's good reason for um, CFOs to pay attention to balance sheet dynamics for, for doing this. So just to go back uh, under the hood again, so to speak, if I can use another uh, pun, uh, the uh, machine learning wasn't originally there in your uh, sensing. So describe how that came on and how that sort of changed the game for you. I'd love to say that we were in control of that, and I, and I tried to be, but I failed spectacularly. So 
there was a kind of feral outbreak of, uh, of the machine learning. The moment that the libraries became available to be able to build your own network learning tools, I got the R&D guys together and said, you know, how do you think that uh, we can best exploit this? Because I could see that racing wanted to do something, sports cars wanted to do something, and applied technologies guys wanted to do it. Um, I think we were about six weeks into that conversation and we were already um, had stuff in Azure, in AWS, in Google, tools everywhere. So there was just no way of controlling that. It just, it just went everywhere. And I think what we see now is that with that, um, with that belief in, in, in modeling, um, whether that modeling is a car or whether that modeling is a patient care path in, in some way against which we map structured and unstructured data, once we've got that, then we can, we can run a federated simulation system. And, and the AI, or the machine learning tools in particular, offer real-time, very fast, heavy lift. So, um, which is great for people, because a lot of the uh, access to information and data means that young people will get great jobs and, and opportunities for young people to come and work and get immediate insight and learning of the fundamentals in the business without having to do all of the administrative noise that goes with, with some of that stuff. So it does all the heavy lift for us. So uh, we'll go on to some of the non-racing applications, but um, I just wanted to get a little bit to the uh, infrastructure you use. You rely on a lot of partners uh, as well. What are some of the key technology partners? Um, well, it'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Dell, of course, and we are pre appreciate I'm sitting here as a, as a guest of Dell Technologies and our partnership with Dell um, is uh, probably three years old now. But we've been using, um, we've been using all the Dell, the seven core technologies in Dell for 20 years. You know, we'd started at the edge, we'd had computing, but so from, from edge computing, blades, um, servers, secure works, secure data transition, uh, all of our core compute, uh, and then back out into cloud services. Um, we have great infrastructure partners because like everybody here in this room, you know, the days of us writing our own built-in operating system, and I've lived through all of that, uh, are done. Um, th that's just not where we are going to move fast enough. So as we come up the abstraction level out of hardware, security, and platform level connectedness, we can then really focus on where we add value, which is at the software layer. So, so given the APIs and our engineering knowledge, because we're a products business, then we really want to operate at, at that uh, simulation and plug-in level. So we've kind of moved ourselves out and up the value chain in that respect. So you guys are known for a continuous development methodology. Uh, talk a little bit how your own organization had to change to, to uh, sort of uh, get the new skills you needed over time. So I was in um, Beijing last week, um, and a journalist asked me a question about how did old guys like me manage to stay abreast of the technology, which was not exactly flattering. Um, but I do remember having to do, as a young engineer or young physicist as I started, having to do hand calculations um, and hand them to a chief engineer for things that are now, which is, well, my daughter who's a mechanical engineer would think I'm crazy. Um, what's happened over that, that period of time is the, the kinds of people that we're recruiting um, are different. The universities are turning out fantastic mechanical engineers, aeronautical engineers, but they're coming now with a master's in data science or, or computer science. And proportionally, we've seen the shift towards recruiting, um, whether it's at apprentice level or undergraduate level or postgraduate level, um, a, a greater set of skills in, in data science and, and computational science, but usually with, a, with an underpinning physical science or a natural sciences degree underneath. Um, and then in about 2000, when we started to really heavily invest in the simulation, I would have said that at that point, most of the key performance decisions were taken by chief engineers who were very experienced, average age, mid-career people, and decisions were then taken at the point of most experience because that's where the risk and the pattern recognition um, was, as well as a lot of the domain knowledge. What's happened then is through, the, through that digital, first wave of digital transition, when we were just bringing time series data in, we had the rise of the analysts, and by about 2006, 2007, that sort of time, many more of the engineering roles were being led by analysts. Um, and then what happened is it, it uh, came to us about uh, four years ago where there was so much data, there was so much simulation that we kind of got ourselves locked in a paralysis. And we'd moved from decision at point of most experience to decision at point of most knowledge, but the knowledge was imperfect. You know, there never is perfect data, there never is enough time. The competitors are always out moving you and taking a guess on risk or 
you know, the, the old-fashioned values of deductive logic, for example, still hold true. And we've had to re-engineer the organization over the last three or four years, in part, which has played a, a, a part in our resurgence as a Formula One team, but to be able to put people who can work with a level of ambiguity, which can be data informed, um, but also recognize that the world, the real world is fuzzy and moving very quickly. So I would say that we've moved from data at, or decisions at most, um, most experience, the decision at most knowledge to now decision at most intelligence, where the intelligence piece, and we use the AI definition, which is knowing what to do next. So knowing what to do next requires that you have to know, so domain experience and knowledge is still, exploring, is still important. But none of us are making binary decisions. Do I do this or do I do that? The real world is, is nuanced and stochastic, and it's choices. Um, so I think that, that requires people to be, yes, students of the game, have the data on hand, but recognize what the insights in the data are telling us and what's not there. And that's enabled us to pick up the pace of innovation again. So it's just getting past that analytics lock-in piece. Was so important. what's the average age of those people? Uh, well, the people now, we, we're dropping um, uh, graduates into mission control at, at 21, 22, and they're taking big calls um, in very short period of time. If you're a data scientist on a particular part of the car on a Grand Prix weekend, you've got around a minute or a minute and a half to decide whether your set of data is real and valid or whether you've got a sense of problem, can you contain it, or do you need to move it up to the engineering layer? And then there's probably another two minutes at the engineering layer and all the engineers are sub 30. Drivers are now 19. Um, so yeah, it's, it's I'm mean going to the garage now and I look at it, uh, I still go to about eight races a year and you look in and you think, this is such a different place now. And I'm glad it is. So, so you, you touched on briefly a thing I'd never l learned, that the, uh, the race teams share this data. This is the data from the video cameras. There may be other data I'm forgetting. But, um, and then that actually that you get a sense of their, uh, of the data, the, the communications traffic. Yeah. So which is, sounds to me like an NSA spook gaming how Osama bin Laden is moving through the, the territory. So uh, give a little sense of that uh, competitive intelligence analysis. So competitive, uh, Formula One's a high pressure environment. If you're at the front, you're always worried about being caught from behind. And if you're behind and you're playing catch up, it's pure purgatory. So you're always looking for, for competitor intelligence and where you can get that from. And the regulating body make available to us all of the in-car video footage uh, from every car. And they also make available all the radio traffic um, and we're not allowed to, um, uh, to to block that or encode that in any way. We used to run uh, highly encrypted um, uh, driver traffic so that nobody could hear what we were saying but th those days are gone. But because of that what it means is that there is information there for those who want to use it where um, even though all of the engineers talk to their drivers in some coded way, we know because we've run the simulations whether it's going to be a one stop, two stop or a three stop race and we know whether it's close. So we know the areas of time in a one and a half hour race where there is going to be some movement or somebody's going to pit early or pit later. And if you feed this, uh, this information into your uh, machine learning, then the machine learning will tell you about 30 seconds faster than anybody uh, can do that on, on paper, exactly what's about to happen. And if you're, if you're racing somebody very closely and it really matters about who pits ahead of who, who, pits ahead of who those fractions of a second, or in this case, 20, 30 seconds of insight and time to react become very valuable. Um, and part of the art of racing now is, is using that real-time data to make good decisions. But a bit like the previous panel, I remain eternally optimistic about the role of humans I in, that, in that loop. There is still very good reason why there are choices to, to be made, and those choices are made by well-informed, well-trained, and well-motivated humans. And it's, the organization is still a system of systems. So you said another interesting thing at breakfast, which was that as you look ahead, based on your, your kids, I think, uh, you can't imagine actually trying to uh, m make a living selling uh, $300,000 sports cars in 10 years or something like that. Um, that might be an overstatement, but, but give us a sense of, of that sort of realization and what that kind of means to a company like McLaren. Yeah, I think, my st I think I started that by saying I can't imagine my daughter making any money. Um, but, but in the event, you know, I imagine my children um, are 19 and 24, um, and they're good kids. Uh, 
uh, if I look at uh, how they embrace the world and, and what things mean to them, then, then the ownership of an asset, um, uh, let alone transport, means a very different thing. Um, transport is just a thing that comes on an app. It's a, it's a service. And as we look at software, you know, software as a service or infrastructure as a service or hardware, everything as a service, then if you look at that generation and, and um, what they need us to be doing as an organization and, and what they will do in their, in their middle years, I'm not so sure that it is safe to rest on, on any of our laurels. You know, it's a, a hackneyed phrase that the world is, is speeding up and will never be as slow as it is today. But if we look at the average life cycle of a FTSE 100 uh, company at the moment, then typically it's around 15 years. So if we think that selling high-end sports cars in 10 to 15 years' times is a safe bet, then I think that's, that's complacent. Um, and I think that when we look at the way that resources are consumed or the way that we have to pay attention to sustainable everything and what that generation of future markets will, will require, we absolutely have to reinvent ourselves. And that's why we've changed McLaren Applied from being a, a, um, an outsourcer or repurposer of internal IP or intellectual property. It is that. But actually, it's about our future. It's about thinking, what are the trends that we can see now? Or where are we going to place capital bets um, in the 5 to 10 to 15 years horizon so that their job is to give us the, the billion dollar business that is sustainable, has purpose, uh, and, and has relevance to what is a very changing generation. And again, as the previous speaker said, who would like to guess what that is in five years at the moment? I don't know, but we've got to get ahead of on this. So <coughs> talk a little bit more about your, your non-automotive uh, businesses. I think you're in medical, some other things. So what the uh, McLaren Applied Technologies uh, has done a number of things. It, it's not a very big business. It's around 500 um, people in, of course, in motorsport. We do all the batteries for Formula E. Uh, and some of the electric machines. We've worked in, in high performance elite sports, in connected rugby, connected football, Winter Olympics, um, a range of, of connected uh, technologies. But what's happened over the last few years is people have come to us for a technical solution because we have got smart people and good technology. But it's become a little bit too much of an engineering services type organization. And we're just going through that, that pain of, of uh, restructuring at the moment as we, we move away from a engineering services related business which is more difficult to scale. We've got partners like Deloitte who we work with for that. Um, and we're looking much more carefully at where will those product streams be. So the fact that we work in motorsport is, is not, not necessarily a, a shock to anybody. We are working in autonomous vehicles but not at the top level uh, AI level. We're working at the command and control systems. So we have products running in, in vehicles around the world that are doing all of the safety critical sensor integration, um, edge compute, uh, fast decision making so that they will let somebody else run. Uh, there are other people investing gazillions of, of uh, dollars in the AI level. Um, connected automotive is very important to us. We just, we've got all the applications. We know the use cases. We just need 5G now. Um, so so you know, I'm less worried about, about that being a hype curve. That, that's just a reality. We all need the connectedness for our vehicles. And we're now doing connected rail. It's a natural thing for us to be able to, if you run sensors on any piece of, uh, uh, of, roll, uh, of uh, rail, whether you're the network provider or the, or the rail operator, th what you can learn from vibrations on a wheel um, is enormous, not just about what the truck has and what its load and its maintenance cycle, but also everything that it's rolling over. So there's a huge amount of insight to be had from there. Uh, we've had a number of um, uh, small scale uh, engagements in the health industry as well. So connected people, why not? Um, we wear sensors or we have sensors on, on racing drivers like Fernando Alonso. So why not sensors on connected people where you're putting um, uh, security services through uh, high temperature environments, for example, to measure human stress? What about um, we did an experiment where we put sensors and telemetry into a children's hospital so that the physicians at the hospital got 20, 25 minutes advanced information about the patient because real-time data would tell you what the child's current condition is. And that first half an hour of patient care when there's in pediatrics or any uh, medical emergency is very important. We've done some work in orthopedics, not that McLaren is going to make the world's best knee, elbow or shoulder, but what we have learned about physical modeling and mapping data onto those patient care paths 
and they was asked to, for insurance companies to drive greater traffic at that particular care pathway. And even now, if I think if I look, look forwards at the health, uh, the health side of things, the technology is there. We all, everybody in this room knows that the technology is there. The difficulty is how do you monetize it and what's going on on the buy side? Because for very good reason, we all want to be very cautious about patient data and security. But for goodness sake, if every one of us wants, uh, ends up in a hospital, all of us would want that digital passport with all of our health information available to whoever's trying to look after us. And you know, if any one of us got some terrible disease, every one of us would want to be somewhere in a research program that, that's using um, science and technology to best effect. And from my, I'm, I'm not a physician, I'm not an expert in this field, but from my impartial view as a father, patient, husband, citizen, and look at this, then on pathology, the technology is phenomenal. Stem cell development, the use of artificial intelligence to work out what's going on in the neural networks, and, and the application of technology there and, and analytics and compute is, is extraordinary. But on the patient side, we all know that we're nowhere. Um, I was working with some people recently looking at motor neuron disease, which is a dreadful uh, disease, one of the many gateway diseases to dementia. We've heard this morning here that we're all living longer. That is true, and that's a good thing, but we're not living longer in a more healthy condition. One in 350 people get motor neuron disease, 30% are dead within 12 months, and 50, 60% are dead within two years. And at the moment, the sampling of that patient data set is done by a physician sitting down with the patient on a quarterly basis using a checksum sheet that's called ALSFRS. I can't pronounce any of those, of the, those things in there. But we know, here people in this room will know, that if you've got embedded ear sensors and a, an emotion sensor on your belt and an application on my mobile phone and secure data, I haven't got to bring that patient in once a quarter. And even if I do bring them in once a quarter, I've got three data samples and 30% of my population is dead. Um, so what about the wearable technology there where for a patient who's going through that, that kind of adaptation, the longitudinal data that we all need to build, both structured, unstructured, the technology exists. It's, and we can make a difference, but somehow we've got to work with the regulators, the state authorities, and the medical profession um, to be able to make a difference there. But um, Dell Technologies has secure data distribution. Mind Maze and the neuroscientists there, they've got sensors in here that will do head droop, blood pressure, blood oxygen levels, mobility, stair walking. You don't have to sit with somebody on a quarterly basis to go through a checksum. That's just Dickensian. Um, so I think we have a responsibility to push a bit on some of this as, as well. Sorry, I'll, if you think I'm on a hobby horse there, it's because I am. <laughs> no worries. Uh, you glossed over connected rugby, though. I, I want to know, it seems like that's going to put people in the hospital, isn't it? Well, no, people are getting into hospital. That's why you need connected rugby. You know, if you watch all the guys in the shirts and the, and the technology that's sitting in the back of their shirts, you know, part of the kicking game at the weekend between uh, Wales and South Africa was you know that everybody's got about 1,500 calories of blood glycogen that's in them. And if you can use that in the first 30 minutes, you've got 30 minutes of a very tired opposition, which then gaps open up. So the kick game was all about turning, turning the opposition around and wearing out the energy. Leaning on somebody when they're getting up uses a bit more energy. You know, it's about sapping the opposition of energy. And then you need to know if you've got sensors and you know every time somebody makes a tackle and where they are on the park, you know how far they've moved, you know how often they've been hit, you know when somebody is about to run out of energy. All of that is just knowable elite sports stuff. So, and that's happening all the time in professional football and professional rugby. So these players have agreed to wear these sensors and they share the data with the other team? No, don't share it with the other team, but uh, in the professional sport, certainly. Um, and uh, again, if you look at American uh, football and, and, and head impact uh, stuff. It's got the same, the design of the, uh, the new helmets and some of the impact analysis that's being done um, is all informed by uh, low impact, low cost, easily wearable technology. So you've come back several times to 5G as everybody on this stage I suspect will. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, qualitatively how that uh, will change your world, particularly the low latency kind of communications? So I think the, the combination of smart cities and um, smart vehicles, I'm gonna stray beyond 
McLaren here for a second, with just mobility generally. You know, we, we all recognize that we're at a transition point for mobility generally, whether it's from last mile mobility or inner city uh, congestion and air pollution, large volumes of, of traffic movement. I think right now every car sold in, uh, in Europe has to have some level of connection because we're required to have an emergency call button uh, in the car. So the we're being pushed by the regulators, which is good, to be able to make the cars uh, more connected. We all want to put our mobile device uh, connected to the car now in, in order to be able to avail ourselves of a range of software services, but every one of us will be frustrated, whether it's with uh, Apple CarPlay or anything else, about as the operating systems are changing on the device, then the firmware changes in the car make those services a bit clunky, and that's, that's frustrating. What we want to be able to do is, is over the air, um, uh, safe and secure updates to car features, car services, um, and be able to know what, how, the, how the customer is using that car, but also how that car's condition is, and then how we can optimize for efficiency, um, so it's not schedule maintenance, it's on condition maintenance, um, and anticipate what, what's going on for the customer. And then we can use those assets uh, in a much more uh, effective and less wasteful way. So we've got about three minutes more. Um, anything in the sort of future uh, uh, projects and or challenges you want to touch on? I think the, the, the challenge for us now, we've been pressed on it as an organization, is that we're really going to have to pick up um, sustainability in a, in a much broader sense. I think uh, we ourselves are, are picking up and, and getting behind the uh, United Nations um, 17 sustainable uh, uh, objectives there. I think obviously there are four or five that, that wouldn't necessarily relate to us as a technology business, but most of them do. Sustainable economic growth and having a sense of purpose for the organization uh, is important for all boards of directors, executives and investors. And our, our investors, our bondholders and our private investors are asking us about that con constantly. But more than that, I think the, uh, the workforce is, is changing and I'm getting asked on a regular basis uh, on the shop floors at, at McLaren by the men and women there. You know, what are we doing? They see that the packaging and the parts and the number of things come through, but they want to know and have some evidence that what we're doing for life below water or life on land uh, is, is important. And as we look at uh, battery technology and how important the move from hybrid through to battery EVs will be, then the sourcing of, of the chemicals and the chemistry and the recovery of those and the protection of many of the uh, elements for the rare earth metals. And if we look out 30 years and say, well, okay, let's, let's imagine that the future is, is electric. We think it is. Battery technology is constantly changing. Motor technology is changing. But actually, the kind of motors that we need and the elements that will make up those rare earth metals, they also need protecting and recovering. And we need to start thinking now about wh what the recovery cycle for that is and not wake up to the fact that suddenly the ocean's full of plastic and then we've got to do something about it. And, and some of those rare earths and things come from kind of dicey places, don't they? They come from all the places that China is investing in heavily. If you want to know what's going on, you just look at infrastructure investment in China and you'll see it right behind that and you'll see all of the rare earth metals. So um, with 5G, do you see vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications being a big thing? Yes, I do. I think vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle, uh, uh, communication is, is inevitable. Um, I think all of us have got some, some hesitation about what will the standards be and exactly where is the edge of the network. I think when we look at real, uh, the architecture, the electrics, sorry, the electronics and the software architecture of cars of the future, then we're moving away from cars having hundreds of computers on them to probably having, I'm guessing, f four or five domain controllers. And those domain controllers will take care of various federated functions. But more of the simulation and more of the modeling is going to have to go to the edge to cope with the data. So we get, I was reading in one of the white papers for this conference that monetized data off a car is about 300 megabytes a day. Well, we're taking 10 gigabytes off a Formula One car over, over two days. Um, terabytes of data coming off cars is coming. We don't want to be moving all of that, that traffic through the network. So I think the edge is going closer, closer to the onboard uh, stuff. So we'll think about multiple edges, uh, I think, um, at this stage. But certainly for us, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, very important um, as part of the whole mobility piece. So just to end, what about an Uber-like service where a, a McLaren driven by a robot picks up your daughter at home? Yeah. I um, <laughs> it, it's an interesting one, that leap of faith for um, conviction and, and security, the point where 
would we be ready to get a vehicle or a bot to go and get the shopping for us? Yes, and it, it, it's happening in, in various places. Are we ready for Billy the transport car to go and pick the kids up from school? N not yet. And I think... Um, it would be a very fast car, I suspect. <laughs> it, it's, as I said, it's not a mobility solution, but uh, Great. it's well not I for everybody. We're at the end of our rope. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and, and thank Jonathan for his contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you.